Throughout the course of the Civil War, various medical advancements needed to be developed in order for doctors and nurses to be able to effectively help those who were wounded in battle. Casualty rates skyrocketed with the introduction of the Meunier Ball and with the railroad being newly implemented into battle technique. Both the North and the South struggled to keep alive those who were wounded. In the Civil War, Amputation was one of the greatest aspects of medical care during the war. Amputation would be performed within a 10-minute time frame. Doctors and their assistants would work 14-hour days. With so many wounded and with the lack of water and supplies, doctors and nurses would not wash their hands in between procedures. Infection was a big deal back then, but it was estimated that 75% of the amputees did recover. In 1863, Chloroform was getting short and wasted, as they had to soak a rag, but while soaking the rag, the chloroform evaporated, until Dr. Julian John Chisholm invented a 2.5-inch inhaler. Chloroform was dripped through a perforated circle on the side onto a sponge in the interior, as the patient inhaled through tubes. Plastic surgery? Try facial reconstruction back in 1862. Dr. Gurdon Buck, now considered the father of modern plastic surgery. During the Civil War, he completed 32 revolutionary plastic operations. Another great advancement back in the Civil War was the Letterman Plan as a system for treating an evacuation of casualties from the battlefield. Dr. Jonathan Letterman created the plan while serving as medical director of the Union Army. One was a war that was fought like never before. A war where many weapons and machines were being used for the first time, causing many wounds and injuries that acted up quickly. That was when medical advancements and techniques took place, saving many lives. Soldiers would be taken to trenches when first injured. Then they would be put onto stretchers, next step to RAP, also known as Regimental Aid Post. Third step would be onto the ambulance that would transport them to the casualty clearing station, later into the hospital train, and last to the base hospital. Surgeons began to notice that many wounded soldiers began to die before they got the chance to be treated. They had no equipment for all the tasks they had to complete. Nurses and doctors began to see horrible wounds. The lack of materials that were needed back then to save lives are the ones that have been taken for granted today. So storing and giving blood was introduced in World War I. It would be transferred directly from person to person by a tube until a U.S. doctor named Oswald Robertson realized it was more important to have some blood stored before more casualties showed up. He was the first to establish a blood bank in 1917. The blood would be kept in ice for 28 days and put in sodium citrate to prevent it from coagulating. Then it would be sent to the casualty clearing stations to be used. Medical technology had a huge role during this war and saved many lives. Casualty clearing stations were better equipped. Medical staff were closer to the battlefield. These changes prevented more delays, saving critical seconds and lives as well. in treating casualties on the front lines today is not much different from World War I. Speed is the main thing that matters. Now there is a medical response team, helicopters with doctors and nurses aboard. Treatments still in use today include shock treatment of wounds, antiseptic wound treatment, containing infection, and PTSD. So World War II was the biggest and bloodiest war in recorded history, but huge medical advances were made right alongside with the killing. 
Huge advances in penicillin were made. It was able to be mass-produced and shipped straight to the front lines. The Red Cross was the chief contributor for relief supplies to civilians during World War II. A lot of injuries were sustained throughout the war along with infections because living conditions were poor. A huge advancement made during World War II was penicillin. Although penicillin had already been produced, it was not very effective. Penicillin is an antibiotic used to fight infections, so as you can imagine, it was pretty important. There was a shortage in penicillin, so the U.S. authorized 19 companies to start producing penicillin using the deep tank fermentation technique patented by Pfizer to try to mass-produce penicillin. 90% of the penicillin sent with Allied troops to Normandy on D-Day was produced by Pfizer because even though there were other companies producing penicillin, no other companies could produce the quality and quantity of Pfizer. The Red Cross played a huge part in the aid of civilians during World War II. The Red Cross sheltered and provided food and water for civilians whose homes had been destroyed in war and had no place to go. At the peak of Red Cross wartime activity in 1945, 7.5 million volunteers, along with 39,000 paid staff, provided service to the military. And most importantly, the Red Cross would bring donuts and coffee to soldiers on the front lines. Disease ran rampant and injuries were everywhere. Living conditions for soldiers were very unsanitary. Trench foot was a very common infection. You would contract the infection from bacteria in the muddy, wet trenches, and your feet would stay wet for a long time. The bacteria would grow, and the infection would take over your foot or feet. Many limbs were lost in the war from bullet wounds or shrapnel from bullets or other shells. Battlefield nurses carried or helped the wounded from the front lines back to the hospitals. There was a chain of evacuation made during the Civil War, where to take soldiers after they had been picked up, this was perfected, quote-unquote, during World War II. The Korean War was a period of new medical techniques, technology, and overall new medical advancements. A time of new experimentation, the Korean War is also well known for mass units. Richard H. Hornberger was a surgeon and novelist. He was born on February 1, 1924. Richard graduated from Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. He received a medical doctor's degree from Cornell Medical School. Later, he was drafted into the Army during the Korean War and served as a surgeon in the 8055th MASH unit in Korea. After serving in the Korean War as a surgeon, he worked at a medical practice in Waterville, Maine, as a thoracic surgeon. He remained in that practice until he retired in 1988. Richard died at the age of 73 from leukemia on November 4th, 1997 in Portland, Maine. Richard greatly influenced medicine because he wrote books on what he experienced during the war. In 1968, Richard wrote M.A.S.H. It was a novel about three army doctors. This was followed by several sequels. Soon, the TV show M.A.S.H. came to play. He also helped write the TV show M.A.S.H. The Korean War provided the labs for medical experimentation with new technology that was created during this era. Many advances included medical systems and patient care. MASH units were one of the greatest medical systems that saved a huge number of lives. Helicopters were essential to bring wounded troops from the battlefields into one of the MASH units. Today, helicopters are still used to transport wounded soldiers. Thousands of American troops suffered from frostbite because of the unbearable cold weather. Many lost their hands, arms, fingers, and toes. Another common injury was face or maxofacial trauma. Gunshot deaths was a high percentage during the Korean War. Many loud, harmful sounds would cause a soldier's hearing to go away. Lung tissues because of radiation or dust. During the Korean War, many doctors and nurses were drafted to the war. As soon as they were out of medical school, they were taken to work at mass units. Many women worked as nurses or anesthetists because there were so many surgeons and doctors. Surgeons were much occupied with urgent surgeries. Nurses had to be collecting a large supply of blood and plasma. There were also pilots who had to drive the helicopters and ambulances. Many amputation techniques came from the civilian medical fields. Blood transfusion started way before the Korean War. During the Korean War, they learned about risks during blood transfusions and amputations. They experimented and learned that these techniques could cause disease, allergic reaction, and infection. Some medical systems are still in use today, 
such as the ambulance system. This helped so that we could get soldiers to a hospital as quickly as possible. be wondering what the Vietnam War is. The war began on November 1st, 1955. It took place in northern and southern Vietnam. Some different medical things that happened in the Vietnam War was that this war was the first to use a helicopter to quickly transport the wounded to a medical facility. Many men who were transported like this were attended to faster with medical care. This idea helped save many lives compared to the lives that had been lost because of the lack of medical assistance. Many men from the United States traveled across to Vietnam. Although men weren't the only ones, women also traveled to Vietnam because they volunteered to be nurses. They also wanted to help their country, the servicemen, and for many other reasons. Helicopter noise landing just outside the emergency department is something that always gets my blood going a little bit because you know that you know, this is ultimately why I'm here. Had we not been trained enough or had we not had that uh, enough medical care or training among the boys, I think that guy wouldn't have survived last week. The standard of care, I think, is second to none. It's, it's amazing to be part of that. Is pretty unique, pretty special experience. You get to be there for that person in that one hour of need where they need you more than they need anything else in their life. And you get to be the person that does that. I think if you don't feel in this job, then you shouldn't be doing the job. You have to separate it, don't get me wrong. You have to, there's at times where you just have to switch off and go, no, this is work. But there's other times where if you don't feel, then don't do this job. Go home, go do something else. The individuals who have deployed out here in the UK Med Group are of the highest standard in terms of their clinical skills. They have quite a prolonged pathway in terms of all the different training levels that they have to achieve to come out here. The majority are working within NHS hospitals. They are regular service personnel, full-time military personnel, but they are working within a military wing of civilian hospitals. The patient pathway starts from the point of injury, and the first on the scene is the combat medical technician. I was with the Gurkhas before. Uh, I've been here on Herrick 9 and Herrick 14 before as well. Uh, but I was in Pintia more rare than a medic. That was what I did. And this tour has been a, a totally different in terms of what I do because I've transferred to be a medic now. And I'm trying to provide immediate first aid, uh, provide that primary care. And that's it. Speed is of the essence in trauma care and the medical emergency response team take the patient back to the Royal 3 Hospital on the back of a helicopter as soon as possible. There's always a risk. Sometimes you'll find out that the troops are still in contact and of course you worry that there's going to be rounds sort of landing at your feet as well. But we have the Apache support, got the FP guys on the back, 
we've got the guns on the side of our aircraft and um, we've got the ground, sign, ground call sign as well. Oh, this is the first time I've done that was on this tour, uh, but it's good to see that you are helping somebody straight away. Whenever the Merck lot go out to land to pick up a casualty or anything like that, we'll push out and we'll provide the force protection so that paramedics can get off the cab and collect the patients properly so the aircraft's uh, secure pulse are doing. First point of entry. Thank you.